Hello and welcome back to Sky Pilot Faith Quest podcast, the video version. Or if I'm not welcoming you back, then just welcome. Glad to have you here. I begin today by telling you about a plan, a bold new plan. Okay, it's just some artwork and graphic design, but I'm really excited about it. Then we get to answer the question, don't buy a Bible. Wait a minute. Yeah, okay, that's a good point. Evidently, it's not a question. So today, I'll say it this way, it's all on the way to discussing the admonition, don't buy a Bible. Yeah, no, you were right. It totally didn't work. The question, it was not mirrors. Welcome to the Sky Pilot Podcast that explores questions of faith, spirituality, and religion. I'm Dan Matthews, and I don't have all the answers, but I do enjoy the questions. Welcome to the podcast where every question is an invitation into a spiritual quest, and you're invited along for the journey. First, let me ask you to take a moment and click on the like and subscribe buttons, then ring the bell. It costs you nothing. It will not get you anything that's going to bother you, annoy you, or sign you up for anything, but it will help this channel rapidly move from total obscurity to just relative obscurity. As I think I mentioned last week's show, last week's podcast, I'm now posting every new episode as both a regular audio podcast, as I've always done for the last 180 various episodes, and also as a video on YouTube, which you're watching now. This has offered some new challenges and opportunities. First, I had initially thought, oh, well, this is going to be easy. I'm just going to record the video version, and then I'm going to just take the audio. I'm going to pull it out of the video version, and I'm going to make that the audio podcast. And I was just into recording the very first video when I realized a fatal flaw in that plan. It wasn't going to be any fun and actually quite frustrating for the people who are listening to the audio version in their cars or, say, on their daily run to hear me say things like, here's a picture of what that looks like. The audio version has to use descriptions to create mental images, pictures for people, where the video version can, well, we can just show the picture. The other challenge is that I need some branding that is consistent across platforms, and I have been receiving some feedback recently that some of my branding is, well, a little stodgy. It needs to be more distinctive, more recognizable, and as I said, more fun, less stodgy. Some of the feedback has said that the broadcast already is, or the video here, already is fun. So let the branding reflect the reality of it. So I've been working on exactly that. And you'll see a change in branding very soon. For most people, that just means the cover art used on the podcast is going to change for them. But if you watch the videos as you are, you're going to see the opening and closing sequences both reflect some of what I'm about to tell you as well. When I started this podcast, I wanted to select a title and a theme that evoked the image of going on a journey, an exciting, fun, entertaining journey. And for me, during my youth, the most exciting fun and entertaining stories about Journey came from one television show, Star Trek, the original television series. So in terms of branding, there is a connection for me between space exploration and this podcast because that's kind of where I've got some of my motivation. My closing charge at the end of every podcast, if you've hung around that long listening to them, urges you to boldly go where your quest takes you. The boldly go part was lifted, uh, I hope pretty on, obviously, from the opening sequence of Star Trek. The name of the podcast uses the word quest, which is both fitting, I think, that we are on a spiritual quest, but also it's another tip of the hat. This one is to a movie that spoofed Star Trek called Galaxy Quest. Star Trek was adventure, exploration, and the first series also was groundbreaking television in a number of really important ways. It was multicultural, it shared a multiracial cast, it featured the first interracial kiss ever on television, and it had a decidedly anti-colonial attitude when it came to space exploration and interaction with other cultures, other religions. 
Tolerance, peace, and understanding were always the objectives when they were exploring, which those are the objectives of this podcast as well. The nod to the comedy satire movie Galaxy Quest is also a reminder that we're we're on an adventure, but it should be fun and incorporate some humor along the way. So in the new branding, you're going to see a bright, colorful logo with a spaceship blasting off to parts unknown, heading out on a grand adventure. The new color scheme supposed to offer the sense of fun, excitement, and be more easily recognizable when displayed on small phones. So it's going to have brighter colors because you can quickly key into these key colors. Oh, and it's intended to catch the eye of a little bit younger audience as well. So purple, green, and blue being the main colors. Now, okay, that's enough of that. Consider yourself duly informed. And now back to your regularly scheduled program. I probably should at this point remind you of the question. Well, the admonition. I mean, by now it's been a while. I began by saying, don't buy a Bible. Okay, this title is admittedly a little clickbait. And by clickbait title, by the way, is simply a title intended to get people to click on a video or a post. But sometimes the word clickbait, clickbait implies that it doesn't deliver on the title promises. Now, this isn't something new. Local television news channels have been doing this for years. They'll run a promo for a news story that sounds really interesting and then follows with an announcer telling you that all you need to do is stay up till 11 to catch that particular segment. And if you do, you often find that they don't deliver at all on the answers they promise. They simply will restate the question, leaving you wondering, why, why did I stay up for this? So first, is the title of this video clickbait? Well, in the sense that I very much picked the title that I thought would garner attention and get people to listen or watch. Yeah, yeah, it is. Am I going to actually tell you not to buy a Bible? Well, yeah, I'm going to do that too, with, with a caveat, of course. But yeah, I'm absolutely going to do that. First, let me tell you about the problem with the Bible. No, seriously, I'm dead serious. Well, maybe not dead serious. But here's what my point is. The problem with the Bible is it wasn't meant for you. No, really. Think about how it was created much of the Bible was written down at a time in which no one had access to books or own books. Matter of fact, books didn't even exist. <sighs> okay, I knew this would happen. A hand immediately goes up in the front row, like Horshack from Welcome Back, Cotter. This is oh, 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 yes, yes, I am aware that the first books meaning bound in a similar form to the way we know books today with pages, were actually created a hundred years before the birth of Jesus. Yes, that is true. You can put your hand down now. But remember, the books of the Old Testament were being written down long, long, long before that. Genesis being written down maybe 1,300 years before that. The Bible was first written on scrolls, and those scrolls were not intended ever for mass publication. The Gospels were written sometime after the death of Jesus, obviously, and there was no expectation when they were written that every follower would get a copy like we might think that you have available to you today as a Christian. They would be read in local worship gatherings in people's homes. Paul's letters that are found in the New Testament, those were exclusively written and sent to the church for which they were intended, and certainly not intended to be replicated for everyone to read. So when we read the epistles of Paul, we're not reading advice to Christians everywhere, although that's the way we certainly approach them frequently. We actually are eavesdropping in on a conversation between Paul and a particular worshiping community. So when the books of the Bible were created, none of them were created with the idea that believers would eventually get a copy of them. In the sections of the Bible that we call books, those sections were to be encountered by early Christians in worshiping communities. That's it. If you were going to get to listen to one of those books as a Christian in the early church, it was going to be in the context of worship. Matter of fact, 
when I was in seminary, I had a classmate who came from a country where owning a Bible was illegal and being a Christian was, let's put this kindly, strongly discouraged by the government. He had to lie to his government about where he was going and what he was going to be doing in order to get out of the country and come to the United States and attend seminary to study. I'm not going to tell you who he was or who he is or what country he's from because, it, well, for his protection. I happened to have him in my first preaching class, and when he pre preached his first sermon to the class, it was long. I mean, it was really long. I, it was, whew, wow, it was long and tedious. It was a Bible study in which he went almost word by word through the Scripture and very carefully explained everything, every detail. He missed nothing. It was it was, well, it was too much. And so after he preached, we gently told him so. Now, before you think that somehow we did something by scolding him, this is the way the whole preaching class works. Somebody would preach, and then everybody would reflect back to that person on what they experienced, what they heard. We reminded him that people today don't have the ability or the desire to sit through that kind of sermon. Times have changed. But what was interesting is he pushed back. Then he very gently, but firmly, gently but firmly reminded us that the people in his church, they didn't own Bibles, couldn't own Bibles. So if he did anything less than that, they would be very upset. They had risked much, risked their lives in some cases, to be there in church that day, and they wanted to squeeze every drop of learning they could from the Scripture for the day, because it was the only possible interaction they would have with the Bible, well, until they gathered again together next week. And even getting together each week was always a bit of an uncertain thing. So they weren't sure how long they would have to go before they could get some more scripture. Now, that's a pretty accurate glimpse into what life was like for Christians in the early church. Also remember that in the early church, there was no Bible yet. There were only separate writings that had not yet been compiled into a single book. The Bible as we know it was not formally agreed upon until three successive councils that took place in fairly rapid succession around the year 400. Yeah, I, when I say rapid succession, I mean in terms of the church's kind of time scale, not as in they happened, you know, every three days. Now, the first printing of the Bible that was even remotely created for public consumption was the Gutenberg Bible, and that was printed in 1455. Now, before we take that as the date that the Bible came to be in the hands of regular people, I have a few numbers to put in perspective what I've just told you. At the time of the printing of the Gutenberg Bible, it is estimated that the total number of books in print in Europe was 30,000. That's not per year being printed. That's the total number of books in existence, period, in all of Europe. Oh, and the run of the Gutenberg Bible was shockingly small, only 180 so there was no expectation that the blacksmith had one of those sitting on his coffee table. When that's not even because there was no expectation that he was, he wasn't going to have a coffee table. I mean, it was 1455. Those were, those Bibles, the Gutenberg Bibles were exclusively being bought by people who had, well, significant resources, probably churches, big churches, and a select group of people with enormous wealth. A Gutenberg Bible cost what that blacksmith might have made in a really good year. And it cost a third of what a rock cottage would cost to have built for him so that he could have a home for his family. So why, you might ask, am I overly emphasizing that the Bible wasn't created nor intended from the beginning to be a book that was in the hands of just anyone who wanted one? Is the point that it is somehow against the intent of the founding authors of the Bible that we have one? No. No, I don't think that would be accurate. They'd be probably tickled to death if they knew that people could go out and get one as readily as they can, at least in our culture. Nor is it the point that I'm trying to make that point, that somehow you shouldn't. 
That's not what they believed. That's not what I'm trying to say. My point has nothing to do with the right or wrong of this, but the usability of the Bible. If the people who put together the very early Bibles, not in print yet probably, but just when they were deciding what books would go where and how they would be presented in a single collection that we call the Bible, if they had known that this would be available to regular people and they were in favor of that, I think they would have organized it in a far more useful way than they did. Look, let's start with the Old Testament. The number of people who go and buy their first Bible with the intent of reading it through is actually pretty large because I've had a lot of these people speak to me over the years and say, I bought my first Bible and decided to read it all the way through. So they decide to read it as you would read any book, right? They've just bought a book. They'll read it like a book. They start at the beginning and they will finish at the end, except they don't make it to the end because the Bible isn't a book. It is a library printed in book form. The name Bible literally means just books, or a good translation of the word Bible would be library. So someone who has never read the Bible and is curious about what it contains, so they go out and buy one. Then they start to read it, first with Genesis, which is the first book, Exodus, that's the second book, and those aren't too bad. They're fairly easy to read as Bibles, books in the Bible go. So they keep reading. Next comes Leviticus. Yeah, yeah, that one's, that one's hard. Matter of fact, I ran across someone, a scholar who had ranked all the Bible in order of difficulty to read. And amongst the five most difficult books were number five, hard, not, fifth hardest was Numbers. Fourth hardest was Isaiah. Third hardest was Leviticus. The second hardest was Jeremiah. And finally, the number one most difficult book to read in the Bible is Ezekiel. My point here is simple. All of those are in the Old Testament, and two of them, Numbers and Leviticus, are going to come up as third and fourth book when you try to read your way through the Bible in sequence. So the truth is, the Bible is not designed to be particularly accessible as it was organized. So let's say, all right, that's not you. You aren't new. You know the Bible fairly well. I mean, you haven't memorized it, but you've attended church. You know the stories really well you are supposed to lead the Bible study that you've recently joined, and you've been assigned the story of the prodigal son, and you feel fortunate. You are astute enough to know that that story is in the Gospels, and you even know that the Gospels are in the New Testament. Maybe you even recall that that particular story is in the book of Luke. And it's going to be fairly easy. You just scan through Luke looking for the word prodigal, and you'll find the story. Except, prodigal isn't found anywhere in the story of the prodigal son. So, let me tell you something. When I was first ordained in my ministry, I used to beg people not to buy a Bible that lacked a concordance. A concordance is simply like an index offering an alphabetical listing of words and phrases, mostly from the text. But a concordance is more, so much more, because it often includes topics and associated words with the book that it is the concordance for. So the word prodigal would show up in a concordance, but not in an index. So you can buy Bibles with pretty good concordances in the back. So my point to the people when I would tell them that in the early days of my ministry was that for the vast majority of us, buying a Bible without a concordance was buying a Bible that would only frustrate and eventually be relegated to the bookshelf. A concordance was the key available to regular people to unlock the Bible in wonderful ways. Look, you don't need to own a print Bible. If you want one, by all means, buy one. But you don't need one. You actually, and this is my major point, you actually live in the golden age of Bible study because you have something so much better than even a concordance. You have the internet. Look, if you decide you want to find the prodigal son, just Google it. And the first thing in your search results will tell you exactly where to find it. 
you'll be amazed how easily it helps you find the exact passage that you're looking for. Now, I can hear people out there saying, now wait, Dan, you said don't buy a Bible, and now you have us looking for a passage to look up a book that we should know. Okay, first, the point of this episode is not that you should not own a Bible. The point of the episode is that you don't need one. Look, when I was in seminary, I spent a fair amount of money, a lot of money, on Bible reference books, so that when I left seminary and was writing sermons or working on classes or doing study, but no longer had access to the seminary library, I could do research on my own. I owned thousands of dollars in reference books, all to help me do exactly this. Eventually, I moved to a large church in Atlanta, and when I arrived, they bought me a computer program that went on my desktop computer that could do most of all of this without my even going to my bookshelf. But by the time I retired, well, I never even opened that program ever anymore because there were websites that could get me the information I needed before my computer had even managed to open the Bible software program. You can do most everything you want to do in terms of Bible study from within Google. You can even look up Bible passages. You can read them all from your Google search. If you want to go a little deeper, then I recommend a site called Bible Gateway. Again, just Google the words Bible Gateway or type Bible Gateway, no space, BibleGateway.com into your browser. This site is very similar to the software I use, well, I used to have on my computer. It allows you to search and also choose from many, many, okay, almost too many, perhaps too many translations. Again, I used to have probably 10 different printed Bibles on my bookshelf, and each was a different translation. It allowed me to pull out the book sometimes when I was looking at one passage and see the various nuances that might be reflected in different translations. Now, this website can let you look up a passage and then see it in any different translation you want to see it with the ease of a drop-down menu. Quick aside, I do the vast majority of my reading now in just two translations. The NRSV, which is probably 80% of my reading, and the NIV. And I have other podcasts about that, about picking a version of the Bible. So if you're interested in that, go onto my podcast and try to find that because it will be more helpful. I'm not going to go into that right now. Okay, finally, some may say, but I don't want to read the Bible on the internet. I want a book. I want paper in my hands, Dan. I like the romance, the tactile feel of touching a book, but I, but I don't want to struggle. Isn't there some way to read the Bible with some sort of helpful training wheels? Yes, there are two that I would re recommend. First, perhaps you actually want to own the whole Bible, as we've just said, just in a more usable form. Then I recommend getting yourself a study Bible. And I suggest something like the HarperCollins Study Bible with concordance and the Apocrypha. Um, now, those apocryphal books are just a small section of books that Catholics include, Protest some Protestants don't, and other Protestants, like the Episcopalians, like me, include but separate them into their own section. Even if you're from a tradition that doesn't read those books, they're worth having for reference pur purposes. Finally, for those of you who do want a book, but don't need or desire the whole Bible, but would like some sort of structured reading plan. There's a series that I really like that's written by a man named William Barclay. He's written commentaries on the books of the New Testament. Now, here's what I like. He takes a bite-sized chunk of Scripture. He translates it from the original language himself and then comments on it. And almost every single entry is easily something you could comfortably read in 10 minutes. So you're sitting in your bed at night, you want a quick kind of devotional thing, or in the morning, quick kind of devotional thing, this is going to be easily manageable. Very often he's giving you the background that you might not know about what's happening in the passage. It's called the Daily Study Bible by William Barclay, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. It was written some time ago, but it 
is really well done and highly accessible and actually not particularly dated given how long ago it was written. I suggest starting with one of the Gospels because that would probably be the easiest and I would suggest Mark or Luke and if pressed, I would suggest Luke. I'm guessing you can get these now in digital form, but I've always owned the paperback version, so I don't really know. And that's really all there is for today. Look, the point of this podcast, this episode, I hope was obvious. The Bible's a difficult book, not easy to read, nor is it particularly fun to navigate, but rather than saying, don't try, I'm trying to impress upon you that we truly live in the golden age of Bible study with the tools that are now available through your computer, through your phone. And if you have something to add, maybe an even better website to recommend, leave it on the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Or send me an email and let me know. As always, I love to hear from you. My email address is dan at skypilot.zone. And on your spiritual journey, may you ask questions, seek answers, and boldly go wherever the quest takes you. Thanks for joining us here today and being part of the SkyPilot Faith Quest community. This is a great place to ask questions you wouldn't feel comfortable or safe asking in other places. And remember, the sign of a strong faith, solid religion, or healthy spiritual journey is not certainty, but that you keep asking questions.